Good evening, everyone. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for coming this evening. Just want to let everybody know that you'll, we'll have time to check out the tables at the end. Um, welcome to part one of our environmental hearing, public hearing, Discovering a Litter-Free Columbus. Before we begin, I would like to thank everyone for their work and preparation for today's discussion, including Sherry Palmer, Program Manager with Keep Columbus Beautiful, who will be providing the presentation this evening. Our panelist, Tim Swagger, Administrator of the, for the Department of Public Service, Division of Refuse, Heather Robinson, Director, Environmental Crimes Unit, Franklin County Prosecutor's Office, Andrew Brooker, Programs Manager, Solid Waste Authority of Central Ohio, Desmond Chap Chapman, who will be joining us up here in a moment, from the Linden Litter League, Adopt an Area, ODOT Adopt a Roadway, and Melissa Tompkins, Chair of the Community and Public Service Committee, Milo Grogan Area Commission. I'd like to thank all the staff here at the Linden Recreation Center who prepared the space for all of us this evening. And I'd also like to thank uh, my team, uh, Lucy, Frank, Jeff Carter, um, of course, Lee Cole back there taking pictures for City Council, and Matt Erickson, our Legislative Research Office, for helping to put together this, this special event. A special thank you to all members of the public for taking your time to join us this evening as we collaborate with one another and discuss how to address litter in our great city. When I joined council in January, I had the opportunity to, I've had the opportunity to make my rounds throughout the city. In that time, it became very evident to me that litter rose to the top of the list of concerns throughout, throughout the community. Many people are plagued with um, alleys that are continually destroyed by people that are throwing their litter out and dumping illegally. We have people coming into our community from other parts of the, the county and, and the area to dump in the city of Columbus. And just a general disregard for, for littering within the community. And so as we started working with this and working with the Department of Public Service and Tim and his team, it became evident that we needed to do something about it. And so that's why we're here today, to have a robust discussion, to talk a little bit about the things that concern you as the public, and also to provide suggestions, solutions that we can work towards in the near future. I'd like to remind everyone that there will be an opportunity to provide public testimony. If you'd like to do so, we ask that you fill out a public a speaker slip over there at the, at the uh, front desk. Each speaker will be limited to three minutes. We'll accept speaker slips through the end of our presentation. In order to get through all the speakers today, we will likely not have time to address every issue that's brought before us. However, representatives from the Department of Public Service, as well as City Council, will continue to follow up with you after today's meeting. The purpose of this meeting, as I said earlier, is to engage and collaborate with the community to foster a strategic plan to combat litter in the city of Columbus. We will begin this hearing this evening with a presentation from Keep Columbus Beautiful, who will discuss the issue of litter as it relates to statistics, crime, safety, stakeholders, and best practices. I'll turn the mic over to Sherry. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this opportunity. This is a great panel. I'm honored to be with all of you. There's a lot of expertise and experience here, and um, we have a lot of uh, good things coming out of it from the community. Keep Columbus Beautiful is a volunteer-driven community improvement program, and we are under the Department of Public Service. We work with about 10,000 volunteers throughout the year and 500 projects. Litter is now our, what, 88% focus. And I can tell you that I came to this job, and if any of, you, any of you have heard me speak before, I will say it and say it again, I came here to plant flowers. So I absolutely hate litter, and I'm glad that we're all unified in trying to solve this problem. In November, we released a strategic litter plan. This is not a plan with a solution, but it is a plan that outlines every single person that is involved in making this a clean city. We have 
you the community, and our neighborhoods. But we start with litter as a problem, and litter is behavioral. All it takes is one individual, and then litter betracks litter. It just keeps coming. So it is a big concern to shape and change behavior that is already instilled. So we have our individuals, we have our neighborhoods, we have our businesses, and we have government uh, and enforcement. And all of these entities together, if you, if you think of a pie, these are the pieces. And the stakeholders all have goals. And if everyone comes together and does this, we will eventually, what I'm saying is we will end littering as we know it today in Columbus. So as Keep Columbus Beautiful, we're involved primarily with volunteers and neighborhoods, and we are looking at the public right of way. Those areas that you look at that make the first perception of a neighborhood, of a commercial corridor, of a city. That's our responsibility because when you drive off of a city highway ramp and you come on to a commercial corridor and that corridor is littered, you are not going to think you want to shop there or you want to buy a home there or walk there because it indicates no one cares and it may per be perceived as an area with high crime. And we also know that litter and crime intersect. And so that's a very important component to keep track of. So in each one of these areas, and I encourage you to pick up a copy before you leave, we've outlined goals for people. Now we've been working over 35 years with volunteers in every neighborhood. We're also part of an affiliate called Keep America Beautiful that shares research and best practices. So putting that all together is part of the plan. We looked at what we did. We have a great variety of individuals who are very, very passionate about the litter problem in our city. And in working with volunteers, we provide guidance, we provide equipment, but we also provide an ear. Bob Seed of my staff, many of you know him, He's the face-to-face -face with the community, and he hears about the illegal dumping going on in the alleys. He hears about what's happening in the streets and our youth. So that is part of what we try to do, is listen and then adapt what we're hearing, what your needs are. When we look at who's cleaning up in our city, we have a lot of groups doing great jobs. Some have 200 people, some have 600 people. Others might be one individual. But we were not doing anything in a sustainable manner. Anything that we could look across the board and say, Linden, we're, Linden is an exception because Linden had for many, many years a litter league that operated very strategically. But that was one of very few communities. So if we had to make suggestions on what we could do to keep our neighborhoods clean, we looked at, we don't have a baseline, we're not measuring other than what people are collecting. So we are asking our neighborhoods to conduct what we call a litter index. A litter index is actually a visual scoring system. It allows you to go up and down the streets and give it a one through four, one being very little litter, and four, let's get the National Guard and bring them out. At the end of this litter index, we're looking at the scores, and that's information for you as a neighborhood. This is your opportunity to take a look at where those fours and threes are. Maybe where they're the two, what can you do better? And develop a plan based on what you're seeing. 
that's your baseline startup. We also are encouraging people to draw a plan that limits the amount of time that you need to spend because we, we are people with lives and we get burned out from going out, you know, to pick up litter. And it's hard to recruit people and sometimes it's very hard to even put big events together. We're suggesting monthly cleanups and the same route and the same date and time every single month that would involve cleaning up those first perception areas, your major corridors, your main arteries, those routes to school where children walk, and any other hot spots. And when you get your route and people know where to come, they know what time every month, then you can divide those areas up and hopefully you'd be done in an hour to an hour and a half. And keeping up on that is amazing. The reason we're suggesting this, it's a best practice. We worked on the south side, we worked on Parsons Avenue, we did two and a half mile quarters there for seven years, and we picked up 85,000 bags of litter. That's an awful lot of litter for two and a half mile quarter until we actually started monthly efforts thanks to a local church on the south side we saw a complete difference the litter wasn't mounting up it was successfully being kept at bay and that's what we'd like to see for every neighborhood now what i'm thinking about is the deep cleaning and we all know that at the house we can go dust a little but you know we've got to do the deep cleaning so once we get organized and people get in the, the route, those big events that are existing, those are great. But we'd like to think about it. I use Philadelphia as an example. Believe it or not, the size of Philadelphia, they have a block captain for every single street. They also have an app, and they, li they link with the police, and they also have an index score for every street. So if I'm standing in front of my house and I punch in my zip code and my address, that app will tell me exactly what the litter score is and what the crime ratio. Again, that connection. So that's the extreme. That's maybe where we'd love to go. I'd like to talk about education. I talked about behavior and education is absolutely fundamental to changing the litter and what's happened why are we seeing all this litter because we've lost generations and generations of young people who didn't have a litter message and so it's okay to throw it on the ground i've talked about this before i grew up people smoked they would smoke in this room we would have ashtrays on our tables take the cigarette butt and we had a place to put it. Our young people don't know that. So for them, their place to put it is in the street, in front of your house. And they're not biodegradable. So we had to teach people about cigarette butts on the ground. You're littering. So we need to start again in our schools. We have a fine educational program. We need to have our young people not only learning about litter and its relationship to the environment, but also doing service. The goal for the monthly cleanups then is that we get a, a list of where these are at in the neighborhoods and we connect our schools. We have a tremendous education director for the city, Rhonda Johnson, if you've not met her, but she really truly believes that our schools need to be part of our communities again. And what better way than to get our high school students who, have, who need service hours working with you who are out there organizing these cleanups, getting their service credits, getting to know their neighborhoods, and building a sense of pride. And you know, we are proud of our city. I know that's why you're here and we need to do a better job of working with that. So we have litter curriculums from K through six that we're rolling out. 
that any, any subject matter we have a litter activity for, we have a design challenge, we also have high school litter-free school zones. So those are some of the programs that we are offering. The white elephant in the room, which I'm excited this group is going to address, is enforcement. We definitely know that there has to be penalties for the law. Litter is against the law. We also know we have a very stretched police force. And so what other innovative ways are we working on enforcement? And I'm proud to say that my boss is going to be talking a great deal about that as, as well as some of the others. So what can you do? Pick up some information. We try to make litter easy. Contact Keep Columbus Beautiful. We'll give you litter grabbers, bags, vests. We'll help you with the plan. We'll talk to you about how to do a litter index. And for Linden, I'm really excited because we have met with some leaders and we want to expand it. But we would like to bring back a bigger and better litter league that encompasses all of South and North Linden so that you have a neighborhood that just sparkles. Again, there's an us in Columbus, and it is up to all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sherry. We appreciate it. We uh, thank you and, and Bob for all the things that you do with Keep Columbus Beautiful. It really is the lifeline and of volunteer efforts for picking up litter here in the city of Columbus. So we, we truly appreciate it. This is going to lead us into our panel discussion. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we'll welcome public testimony right afterwards. I'd also like to note that this isn't exclusive to any one particular area. This is uh, a discussion that involves the entire city of Columbus. So we welcome all to share your ideas, concerns, and experiences. If uh, you were unable to be here today, we ask that you follow up with our office. We're, we'll, we will always accept those calls and, and uh, that type of dialogue. Um, a few of the topics that we want to try to address tonight will be understanding our litter problem and how we can combat it, how do we engage and educate the community to get buy-in, what are the environmental impacts of littering, what programs are available, as Sherry just spoke about with Keep Columbus Beautiful and, and who provides them, who are our city partners today and what are their responsibilities, how much the city spends to address, combat, and combat littering and the legal ramifications of littering. I'd like to thank each of the panelists and ask them to briefly share their relationship to the city and how they partner with the city to combat litter. And to do that, let's start with Desmond and uh, work our way down. Um, go ahead and just introduce yourself and, and what you do and how you relate with the city. Um, my name is Desmond Chapman. and. I was with the Litter League with Greater Linden Development Corporation. I um, organized a couple of those a couple years. I'm a business owner, um, and basically, that's, that's that. My name is Melissa Tompkins, and I am Chair of Community and Public Service in the Milo Grogan Area Commission. Um, I'm Andrew Booker. I'm with the Solid Waste Authority of Central Ohio. I'm Heather Robinson. I'm a prosecutor for Franklin County, so my boss is Ron O'Brien. Uh, I've been a prosecutor for over 20 years now, and I have been specializing in environmental crimes prosecution for about 15 or 16 years. Um, would you like me to talk about my unit, or do you want to? Yeah, you could. Okay. Go ahead. So I'll, I'll take this opportunity to talk about the unit in my office and also the, the Environmental Crimes Task Force as a whole. So it surprises people sometimes to know that in the county prosecutor's office, we've had a dedicated environmental prosecutor for about 25 years. I've only, again, only 15 of those years. Um, but I, my office as a whole, of course, prosecutes primarily felony crimes. Uh, but we made a determination long ago that we wanted also to focus on environmental crimes, including dumping. 
So I know that in the Linden area, for instance, you're one of our hot spots for illegal dumping, and I'm sure some of you are here for that reason tonight. Well, I'm very fortunate because we also have in the county something called the Environmental Crimes Task Force of Central Ohio. And that includes a Franklin County Sheriff's Office detective who investigates nothing but environmental crimes. And then traditionally, we've also had in that program a City of Columbus refuse inspector and a Franklin County Public Health sanitarian who acted as civilian investigators. And they would, I'm getting the, the sign to bring my microphone closer. Thank you. And they, they investigate the crimes that come in through a website and a hotline that we operate. So it's a 24-hour hotline and this, it's a website. And we receive tips directly from folks out in the community as well as government agencies, including police agencies. And then the investigators in our unit investigate those crimes. And what they investigate, they forward to me for prosecution. And I will typically handle that case, whether it's a felony or a misdemeanor. Um, although the nature of our task force is such that we investigate uh, the larger dumping incidents, something where you really would want a detective on the ground trying to find information, um, getting cell phone records, conducting interviews, uh, in investigations that typically place, take place over the course of, of weeks or even months. And this task force is funded by the Solid Waste Authority of Central Ohio, SWACO. And, and Andrew Booker is here, of course, from SWACO. And that unit would not exist without SWACO's funding. So that's my role here. And hopefully, I'll be able to share more about some of the investigations that we've conducted. So, I'm Tim Swalger. I'm the administrator for the Division of Refuse within the uh, Department of Public Service for the City of Columbus. I oversee the refuse collection uh, for everywhere in the city of Columbus residential, and I also oversee East Columbus Municipal and the solid waste inspectors. We have three solid waste inspectors that are responsible for investigating them. They work with the Environmental Crimes Task Force and also Corpus uh, Police. Uh, one is assigned to each area of the city. Uh, refuse stations that we work out of, so each station has their own solid waste inspector to investigate those crimes and collect the data and uh, see what we can do uh, in those cases to stop illegal dumping for the mainly is what solid waste inspectors will be handling. And of course, I'm Council Member Emmanuel Remy. I am over Public Service and Transportation. That's my committee, the Environment Committee, Smart Cities, and Administration Committee. Um, in civil service, I'd be remiss not to, to put that in there. But um, certainly um, excited to have all of you here today. Thank you for coming. And let's start down with Desmond, and this is a question for everybody. In your opinion, what are the three main causes of litter in the city of Columbus? In my opinion, and I'm a firm believer of everything starts from home. So like you got kids, like Ms. Palmer said, you know, you got kids seeing parents throwing trash out and, you know, then you got everybody throwing trash out now, you know, so. Um, and then you just got people that just don't care. And then you got people that are just not aware of it. Oh, you know, they so used to throwing trash out, so it just becomes like second nature. Probably a lack of neighborhood unity, um, education, and accountability. And when I say neighborhood unity, um, for example, in our neighborhood, I may not see someone who is probably dumping out in the backyard, but my neighbor across the alley will see. And because we've been around each other for a very long time, they will call us or they will come outside and let us know that it's happening so that we can catch them right then and there on the spot. So I think. Um, Unity is a big part and everybody just kind of working together and getting to know one another. Um, when, I, when I mention education, I say that because I, I also spoke with a fairly new neighbor who is now in a home but came from like an apartment complex. And, and I kind of asked, you know, as they were dumping out their trash, did they not know this, did they not know that? And, and they did not know. Um, because they were just used to putting things out and then an apartment manager or someone else would, um, would pick that up. And so um, what I, I work really 
closely with the Civic Association, and um, they head up our Keep Columbus Beautiful projects and um, the neighborhood cleanup. And we were talking about this recently about the education and just making sure that people are aware, one, how you properly dispose of the trash so that when it is empty, it doesn't go everywhere. Um, so we're working on trying to put that together. I don't think people realize that you have to actually put it in a bag. Some people don't realize you have to actually put it in a bag. Um, another thing as far as education that I just learned this year um, in a meeting with code enforcement is that you're actually responsible for any garbage from your front door to halfway across the street and then from your back door to halfway across the alley. And I think if people realize that, again, they would also um, be more willing to step up and say, hey, pick that up, you know, or don't dump that there, or just, you know, less likely to just kind of ignore it and let it be there when they know that that's going to fall on them um, and be their responsibility. And then just basically accountability, people being accountable. Um, because some people purposely come over into the neighborhood. Um, I know as our neighborhood is revitalizing, there has been homes that have been worked on and then things placed out in the alley. So it's actually increased um, and we've noticed that, but we're very diligent, we're very watchful. <laughs> and um, that, that's kind of how we're, we're combating. Well, certainly I think um, community education is important and awareness of the impacts of, that litter has on communities, the negative impacts. Um, I, I do also, uh, it's not really directly related to the question, but I want to follow up on something that Heather talked about. I think that a lot of people don't realize that there are avenues to report this information. Columbus obviously has the 311 line that people can use. The Environmental Crimes Task Force, one of the central programs that we implement is a website and a phone number that people can use uh, to report open dumping and littering. Um, I brought a, a little cards and they're over at the table over there. Their, their website is called itsacrime.org and the phone number is 871-5322. Any citizen can use this resource, and it's there for citizens' use, to report open dumping and littering. Open dumping in particular will either be handed over to the city inspectors if it's within the city of Columbus, and if it's elsewhere, um, it's, it's handled by a sheriff's deputy. We work closely with the city to identify the kind of hot spots in the city and to try to coordinate resources and strategies to address these. But this. Um, this resource is, I think, is a, a valuable one for people who want it because really in order to address this, um, as a couple of folks have said, enforcement is key um, and in order to enforce it, there has to be a report of some kind to act upon. With that, uh, I'll piggyback on that because um, one of the things that we funded this year that you'll see in the next couple of months is the mobile PD app. Um, I believe, do we have information over there? Yeah, so we have information up at the front table, but this will be another avenue where um, you could literally snap a, a picture of whatever you might have witnessed and send it through the app and communicate directly with, with our police resources. And we'll make sure that that connection's made with our solid waste inspectors, of course, and then as far as uh, the prosecution of it. So, um, this was something that when we were looking at this app, I had this in mind that this would help in this regard to, to try to help combat the littering and dumping within the city. So real optimistic on this. Um, it's in development right now, and we should see this within the next couple of months. Heather? I'm a prosecutor, so <laughs> that color is what I'm going to say. But in my opinion, by far the main cause of dumping in this town is greed. It's greed. It's driven by greed. So um, a typical scenario that we have, someone will be cleaning out an apartment complex or an apartment, uh, maybe a rental house, and they'll have debris left over from previous owners and maybe a little bit of construction debris because they've painted the walls or fixed holes in the ceiling or, or whatever the, the case might be. They will hire someone, it may be one of their own employees, the landlord, but sometimes they just hire a fly-by-night hauler, my name for them, and that hauler will be paid maybe 100 bucks, $150, to get rid of the material, and they will drive two streets over and dump it in the alley. 
And they do that because they want to maximize the profits. They don't want to pay the tipping fee at the landfill. They don't want to pay the gas to go down to the landfill, et cetera. So greed's at the heart of the vast majority of cases that I handle. And it, it ends up as random litter on the street as well. So obviously we have people dumping large amounts of trash, dumping tires, so these scrap tires, which are a bane to, to our existence, I think, construction debris. Um, but that ends up being smaller amounts of, of litter because one of the things these folks like to do is they'll drive up and down the alleys and they'll fill the 300-gallon containers with this debris. So instead of going to the landfill, they'll dump them in the 300-gallon containers. And when those containers are full, where do residents have to put their trash on the ground? And then animals get into it or people drive over it, it gets blown around. So. In my opinion, it all comes down to greed. There, there is a small component of it that is laziness. I usually find that riding on the back of greed, um, but sometimes it is a case where they're just too lazy to take it down to the landfill. So obviously, when you're dealing with greed, and, and I have this situation on all types of criminal cases that I prosecute, um, I think the most effective way to attack that component of it is strong enforcement. You have to make dumping, the penalties of dumping, too costly to be considered just a cost of doing business. Because I guarantee you that there are people out there, these fly-by-night haulers, and unfortunately sometimes the people who hire them knowing they're going to dump, who are considering any potential penalty to be a cost of doing business. Yeah, I'd agree definitely with that, Heather. Uh, we see that all the time. Uh, so. It's personal responsibility. Uh, we, we have people that uh, it starts with our youth, making sure they understand what they're supposed to be responsible for, not having someone else uh, clean them after them, taking care of them, and understanding that if they drop something on the ground, they should be the ones picking it up and putting it in the uh, trash can. So we have to start at a young age through the education process of getting them to understand that. Uh, so there's a lot of personal. There's also the lack of enforcement. Uh, that's, you know, littering is a very, uh, hard thing to see and to convict somebody as Heather will, we don't always see it. We don't have a witness statement. We don't have video of everything. So it's very hard to catch a lot of people littering. So the litter's out there. So the lack of enforcement is due to the fact that uh, we, we just don't have enough eyes or people willing to step forward and stop, stop what's going on out there. Uh, so we certainly need uh, the community's help in that area. And then uh, it's a lack of knowledge as well. Uh, about what they can and cannot do with trash, what they can and cannot throw away, what they can and cannot put into a dumpster, trash can, 300 gallon, what they're allowed to do with construction debris. So we have some education side to do there as well. Thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna direct this question to Heather. However, any of the panelists feel free to, to uh, jump in. In your experience, would you, there's two, two parts to this question. In your experience, would you say that most individuals are aware of the consequences of littering in the city? And could you share the consequences, what those consequences are, and how this information can be accessed and shared, accessed and shared with the public? Just to, just to be clear, when I'm involved in a case, it's typically a larger open dumping case. So if it is somebody who throws a, a wrapper onto the ground, there is harm that, that is a result of that, but those types of cases are typically prosecuted by the city attorney's office. Um, so again, when I get involved, it's gonna be a more serious incident in terms of the amount of material dumped. But there are penalties. Uh, open dumping is a felony. The maximum penalties are four years in prison and a $25,000 fine potentially if you're dumping larger amounts of material. If you are throwing smaller amounts of items onto the ground or into the water, you can be charged with littering. And the mac that's a misdemeanor, and the maximum penalties are up to $500 uh, and 60 days in jail. So there's a, quite a big divide here. I, I can tell you that regardless of someone is charged with a misdemeanor or a felony, uh, they are usually quite surprised when they come into the courtroom and they realize that, first of all, they've been investigated by a detective or by a refuse investigator for the city of Columbus, that they've been charged or indicted, and then they get to court and here's a prosecutor telling them these potential penalties. There is an element of surprise to that, not because they don't understand the penalties, in my opinion, but because they think people aren't watching and don't care. So they're surprised that there's enforcement. 
Uh, and then they're very surprised when uh, I, I don't offer, you know, a, a $25 fine and they can walk out of court. So I talked about the maximum penalties, but what we're always looking to do is to try to modify the behavior because we want them to stop dumping in our alleys and in our parks. So I like to use probation with a lot of conditions of probation that try to impact their future behavior. So one thing that we like to do is uh, if, for instance, they've been dumping on a particular park, we will make them a dump site monitor. And as part of their probation, they have to monitor that park. And if anyone else dumps there, they have to call our detective and report it. And then they're responsible, after the detective has gone out and photographed the scene, for cleaning up that material, even though they didn't dump it, and then properly disposing of it. Um, so um, another uh, type of, of, actually, tires. This could be an, an entirely different, separate issue. but. Um, Tire dumpers in Franklin County know they're going to get in trouble because we've prosecuted dozens of them, probably over 100 of them now. And so they, the word in the, is, is out on the street they're going to get in trouble. But um, what we'll do is we will make sure that they can't haul tires, that if they're caught even with one tire in the vehicle, that that's a probation violation. So these are just uh, tricks that, or techniques that we use. In terms of somebody who is throwing a wrapper on the ground, and this was so interesting in Sherry's presentation, and I so agree, this, we need education because I think that we have missed that generation of kids who didn't have some of those great public service ads that we had when we were growing up, if you're older like me. Um, but even they know it's wrong to do it. I mean, does anyone really not know it's wrong to throw a wrapper on the ground? We all know it's illegal. So I think that, too, comes back to the fact that they just don't think that there will be a consequence for it. So I, I don't think that the suggestion is, oh, you just put people in jail, although sometimes that is appropriate, and we do that. Um, but I think enforcement is very important. Well, I think part of that is, uh We've talked about the $500 fine. I mean, it, there is such a thing. The problem is, is you know, in a well, you can explain that better than I can. You know, how do you prosecute somebody, uh, especially when there's no physical evidence? For instance, if you didn't catch them mid, you know, dropping something out of their hand or something along that those lines, it's those. That's a challenge, correct? It is. That's a great point, actually. I'm talking about cases where we could actually figure out who dumped the material. In most, most cases, we cannot because there is no evidence left behind in the pile that's been dumped, especially true of tires. Um, and often, we can't get people to come forward as witnesses to say, you know, to admit that they saw it and to provide us with information. And that's a huge problem for us, too. A lot of this dumping is occurring in heavily populated areas, and I know that somebody sees it, somebody has seen it, but without people being willing to come forward and tell us what they've seen, it's useless and I can't do anything. The detective can't solve that crime, the City of Columbus Refuse Inspector can't solve the crime, and I can't prosecute it. That's a great point. Is there, are, is there a way that we can tell people that might be watching or in the audience tonight, is there a way that we can you know, they, they do witness this. They could be part of, um, you know, evidence, evidence that could be useful for prosecution. Again, call in the numbers that, that Andrew mentioned earlier. Yeah, the, the, uh, I mean, Heather's exactly right. I mean, so many times we just don't have a license plate number, a description, any kind of, uh, of actionable information. And so, and it really, I think, harkens back to some of the comments made by our panelists about community pride. Um, and trying to take some responsibility. If we can get uh, photographs, for instance, can be uploaded to the website, um, and maybe your, the app will be similar that you were talking about. Um, so if you can get a photograph of a, of a license plate or an individual uh, doing this or a description, um, it's, it's critical in terms of being able to, to turn around an actual you know, in investigation and prosecution. Um, but that stuff can be reported on the website or through the phone number. So for us, one of the things we get a lot with our solid waste inspectors, we'll get citizens call in and say someone was illegal dumping but not leave their contact name or information. 
and with that information, we just end up having to go collect it, pick it up, and there's nothing we can do. We can't prosecute somebody without a witness statement. So when you call it in, while we appreciate that you're reporting the illegal dumping, it really doesn't do anything to curtail it because without a witness to it that's willing to sign, you know, give us a statement, we just can't simply prosecute it uh, based on an anonymous phone call into the office. So we'll end up just collecting that material and moving down the street, and it doesn't help us or you uh, with in those regards. If I may follow up on that very briefly, uh, we do have quite a few people who call in tips to us. And I've had many cases over the years where witnesses have taken photographs and have taken videos even of the crime occurring, and they've forwarded them to our task force. And we've prosecuted the individual successfully. And I should note that in the vast majority of cases, uh, witnesses don't actually ever end up coming to court because most people plead guilty in these types of cases. I could never promise that, of course, but usually you don't end up having to come to court unless you want to. Uh, but I do make an effort to reach out to everybody who calls in with a tip that results in a case being filed. Um, I do reach out and talk to those witnesses to let them know what happens on the case. All right. So, I, um, like I said, I own a um, barbershop, a, a business in the Linden area, and I'm, I'm really tired of coming to the parking lot and just see piles of trash, just piles of trash, and I'm the one that's got to clean it up. So I'm asking the, the Ms. Prosecutor, would it be a way that we can start something to where citizens like me, Ms. Peggy, and my lady right here, we can write citations? I mean, I know it would be dangerous, but, you know, somebody that's under oath, that's trustworthy, my, my supposition would be that probably putting up cameras would be your better bet so that you'd have evidence, you know, if you could have in your, your uh, parking lot, facing out towards your parking lot, that could be information that could be provided. Well, what about that, somebody driving down the street? Like I was behind somebody just threw, throwing stuff out the, you know, throwing stuff out the, out the car. So we have that same website and hotline that Andrew mentioned. Um, if you let us know that there is somebody who's been throwing debris out of their car, the Franklin County Sheriff's Office will investigate. I mean, they'll take down the, the uh, license plate number. They'll figure out who it was. If it's a small piece of trash, then they'll do what is typically called a, a warning letter, where they send out a letter letting them know the Franklin County Sheriff's Office has been advised that they're littering. Um, and they send out a car litter bag as well, which always amuses me, actually. But um, in other cases, they can actually take that information and develop it into a criminal case. So the tool is already out there to report these. Really, the issue is just letting people know that the hotline and the website are there and available for use. And in terms of who can write a citation, the Ohio Revised Code, our, our laws actually say who's allowed to do that, and, and citizens off the street are not. And I would be worried about your safety, too. Uh, but cameras, as Council Member Remy mentioned, they are one of the best tools we have in open dumping and littering cases because that can gather for us the evidence that we need to figure out who did it and to charge them and prosecute them. So uh, on a, the best thing that you could do from my perspective would be to figure out, you know, keep your eyes open, put up a camera in the parking lot. Um, if you can't, you can talk to our unit and we have resources available. Uh, we might be able to put a camera up for you for a period of time. And then uh, use your, your investigative device here, <laughs> your, your cell phone, to take some video and take photographs. And just keep your eyes open and be willing to be a witness. That would be very helpful. All right. And with that, real quick, uh, with that, the city of Columbus, uh, if we've just recently, uh, the mayor has approved purchasing and increasing the number of cameras we have. So we have, we will soon have 50 cameras available throughout the city that we covertly put up to stop illegal dumping. So if you have hot spots, if you notify us of where those hot spots are, uh, we will covertly put cameras up, uh, start tracking that, and try to catch that evidence ourselves. Uh, but of course, a lot of people, businesses, and property owners already have cameras. So if you see it and you have cameras on your house or your uh, business, we would ask that you look on those cameras to see if you happen to catch anything, because that's evidence that we could use as well. So this next question's for everyone, but I'll kind of focus it down towards Desmond and Melissa a little bit because I'm sure if you haven't been able to do this you've thought about it how do we engage residents and get them involved in litter cleanup well I mean we have to start with what worked before 
I, um, I did some investigation and um, I heard that Mr. Ben Epsby, he did a program to where they take the kids and clean up and then they have incentives like to where they take them to what was Wanda Lake back in the day. Um, yeah, and then just the litter leagues and just have people spread the word, just try to get the younger people to get involved, which is going to be hard because they want money, you know what I'm saying? So um, just got to try to put something together. Okay, make it up here. Um, well, about, about three years ago, um, we started uh, So Fresh and So Clean. Um, our current chair, Charles Tompkins, and Nate Lapish from the Milo Grogan Recreation Center um, started the So Fresh and So Clean um, cleaning event, which covers the entire neighborhood. We have volunteers that come from outside of the neighborhood and come in and participate because we make it the entire neighborhood. And then also on a monthly basis, we do our projects, What Keep Columbus Beautiful. So um, on the fourth Saturday of the month, um, we go out and, and clean those uh, targeted areas. Um, as far as getting people involved, I, I think just, again, just the engagement of the, the residents in your neighborhood, just going out. We have community newsletters, for instance, that we take out once a month. And then as we are taking them out to each person, as we do it consistently, they get comfortable with us, they get to know us. Um, we let them know about when we're doing different events, if we're working in the garden, if we're cleaning up, if we're just, you know, sometimes we just have little parties just to kind of get to know each other. But that kind of, you know, makes people comfortable and make them want to participate. And then I think just seeing people do it. And they see it's kind of contagious to be excited and be doing something. And people are, hey, what are you guys doing? And they want to come out and join. So it's kind of a variety of things. But um, we, we're still you know, learning as we go what works and what doesn't work. Have any suggestions, questions? Okay. Um, and then back to, again to Melissa and Desmond, because I think you're best suited to answer this question. I hear it constantly, but what impact does litter and debris in the community have in your neighborhoods? Well, I guess it would, it would just make people not care, you know, just just sadness, I guess, and just keep us in that state of mind until we got people that want to clean up, I guess, you know, so. Before I respond, I would like to say, um, just to clarify for calling into 311, I think there are people who don't understand. You don't put it out and then call 311 bulk pickup. You actually call them first, and then they will give you a date and a time of when to pick it, put it out there for pickup. And I wanted to mention that because I know that there are people who, I, that's something I hear all the time. I put it out there and a code enforcer came around and he didn't give me a chance to call. And so we are working to educate. Um, again, we're working on flyers and just kind of trying to consolidate all of this information to be able to share with the residents so they know the proper way because what will happen is that the alley would be completely clean and then as soon as they put something out, here will come a dump, you know, someone dumping from somewhere outside and they'll see that pile and they'll just kind of start adding, adding to that. So um, that, that's something I just wanted to share um, with everybody. There is a, a way to go about the 311. <laughs> There's a process. You don't put it out and then um, they come pick it, because it normally takes about seven days, actually, for them um, to come and pick it up. But as, as far as um, j just engaging, I, th I think it's just, uh, you know, it's just, you, you kind of have to get out there and do it, and then I think that kind of draws people, draws your neighbors out to want to join you and, and be involved. Thank you very much. And that is a very good point about the bulk pickup. But we've, the, the administrator and I have talked extensively about uh, bulk pickup. And really, the residents should not be putting out their bulk pickup until they've got that date. And they should do it the night before and no sooner than that. I think no matter what part of town you're in, whether you're aff afflicted by litter and self and alleys, et cetera, we've all lived in the communities where they set it out the day they realize they've got bulk and their date's not for two weeks from that point. 
So, and I know the average is less than that, but, um, but we certainly want people to be aware that you should not put out your bulk prior to the night before that pickup date is. Don't make your neighbors have to stare at your bulk pickup. Tim, do you have any comments on well, that? Well, yeah, and when you, they do place it out that early, it, it tends to grow on its own, that pile. So then when we get there, that pile may not, it may have uh, 20 other items that we can't get now because we, you've called in a couch and a chair, we send out a truck, and now all of a sudden there's, you know, four couches, two mattresses, a box spring. You know, that pile has gotten so big that it won't even fit on the truck that we've sent out. So then it sits out there longer until we can come back again. So if you, if you don't put it out early, it doesn't have that habit of, getting everyone else to drop their stuff on your pile. And can you, can you explain to people um, why it's important to have the contents of what you're putting out for bulk because of the routes that these, these people run and, and that's sort sure. of thing? Yeah, we have two different types of trucks that go out and pick, out, pick up bulk. Uh, we have rear loaders where two, two uh, people will be on the back of the truck, stuff that they can physically lift up and put in a truck, or we'll have a grappler truck, which is a knuckle boom with a big claw that will pick up the bigger items. So it's important that we know what type of items you have when you call that in so we know what type of truck to send out there so that we're not wasting time by sending a smaller truck out there that can't handle it and then we have to come back at a later date with a bigger one. And, and when we do that, you've taken away a bulk stop from someone else if, that, that could have gotten something picked up as well. So it's important to let us know what type of uh, uh, items you have in that bulk set out. Um, this is really for Tim and Heather mainly, but what would you say the top five areas of Columbus are that have been significantly impacted by litter, illegal dumping, and, and what, what have we done in the city to address this? The, the areas within Columbus we most frequently see um, are Linden, Franklinton, and the Hilltop. Uh, by far most of our cases are in those areas, but I should also say we have cases in every part of the county. Uh, Dublin, New Albany, Hilliard, all, every part of the county has dumping cases. But we see most of them in those three areas. And I've thought a lot about why you know, those areas just seem to have such issues with this. And I certainly don't have the answer to that. Though. But I, sus I suspect some of it has to do with, um, with perhaps a larger concentration of rental units that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, one of the common scenarios we see is that when between tenants, the landlords will go in and do clean outs and, and do some small construction renovation. And that, so you just have a lot more of that bulk type of material being generated. And when I first started as an environmental prosecutor about 15, 16 years ago, I really thought that I would see in these uh, more problematic areas a lot of outside waste being brought in. But what I've actually seen is most of it is generated in those areas because people don't tend to drive far from the site of generation to dump the material. So we have this juxtap juxtaposition of very um, proud community oriented folks living there but then there are people who are hiring people to haul away bulk and they dump it two streets over, which is very unfortunate. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to mention about those areas, um, I know people who've heard me talk before, I know that I've said this many times, but nothing good ever happens in an alley. And I think alleys by their very nature, they shield you from view, and it's, you know, it's, they're in people's backyards, first of all, they're not on the streets, obviously, and then second, people build privacy fences along them and garages shield them from view, and then you have shrubbery and you have trees, and you have these tunnels of seclusion. And if I were a criminal, frankly, regardless of what type of crime it was, and I wanted to conduct some criminal activity, I'd go to an alley, just because it's, it's an easy avenue and it's secluded. And then we put those 300 gallon containers in the alleys. And I know that there were a lot of great reasons for using those containers. And, and I'm not gonna comment on the good policy behind it, because I think there was. But these are basically giant receptacles for illegal dumpers to come and easily dump stuff into. And again, they never just dump it in, they dump it around and then it gets spread around. Uh, and I think that's part of the issue also. And when you have one container being shared by multiple houses, 
you don't have that sense of responsibility for that container. And so there's no one person who would look at it and say, well, there's trash around the outside of it. I should go pick up that trash. When everyone shares the responsibility, sometimes it feels like no one wants to take the responsibility. So th those are my thoughts on it. Tim, what, um, what are those top areas and what, what have yeah, we done already? I mean, to I'd agree with Heather on those top areas. That's certainly where we're spending the most significant amount of time uh, investigating ourselves with the solid waste inspectors. Mainly what we're doing there is um, we are starting to look at those 300-gallon containers. We're starting to do conversions. We're starting to remove those from alleys where we can. Where space permits, there are some prohibiting factors, so not every 300-gallon can come out of an alley because if you don't have uh, places to place containers in the front or f houses physically can't get to the front due to hills and other reasons that may not always be possible to move. But we are looking at those 300-gallon containers and switching those out uh, to 90-gallon front service uh, containers for a lot of the areas of the city of Columbus. Uh, we started on the west side uh, two weeks ago, just did our first conversion. We've got one going in uh, the Alum Creek area. We're doing 520 homes down there uh, uh, here in a couple of weeks. And then we'll be coming up to uh, this area in the South Linden area and switching over about 235 homes there. Uh, and that's the first phase of it. We're going to continue to investigate these in, in next year, continue to switch out wherever we can possibly do it. Not every 300-gallon container is going to go away, but every one that we can physically get rid of, we're going to. For those same reasons, we've, we've noted that they're uh, illegal dumping magnets. We have to get rid of them. There's also a cost to those to us because now we're, we're spending more uh, repairing containers because they dump large items in it. When we dump those containers, we're tearing lids off, breaking lids, we're breaking containers. So there's an overall financial uh, cost to the city of Columbus as well. So we're going to move those containers to the front wherever we possibly can uh, throughout the city. But I'd agree those three areas are our biggest areas uh, of concern. Tim, how much, just a real quick question. How, how much do you would you say that you spend out of your budget on litter? On litter, it's, it's a little uh, different. I mean, we spend several hundred thousand dollars a year dealing with litter, but also street maintenance within public service picks up litter as well. They do all the right-of-way pickup, and they spend hundreds of thousands of dollars. So there's a lot of money being spent by the city of Columbus already combating litter. Uh, and that, that number just continues to grow because the problem continues to grow. And that's why we're here talking about this, because we, we, we can't keep up with it. We have to change something that we're doing out there because we're not going to be able to keep up with what is going on out there. Andrew, I have a just a quick question. How does Swaco fit into all this? I mean, you know, you, you're the overall authority, you know, for the area. And, you know, we talked a little bit about the resources that you throw into the environmental task force, but what would you, how does Swaco fit overall? Well, uh, you know, we work with all communities in Franklin County. Um, so Columbus, obviously, is a very important partner of ours. Um, and we work with the city and Tim on a number of, of issues, not just open dumping and littering and things like that. Um, you know, we operate as, as best we can through a partnership model where we partner with the prosecutor's office, the Franklin County Sheriff's Office, and the city, um, really trying to identify these problem areas, see if we can kind of pool resources as best we can to address them, um, kind of sharing kind of best practices and what works and what doesn't work, um, partnering with the city on the education messages in terms of littering um, and understanding kind of what, what uh, education tools we all have that we can bring to bear. So we really try to partner as best we can with all of the, I mean, as you can see, there are a lot of different entities that kind of touch this issue, and we really just try to support um, all the partners as best we can. And, and with that, I just want to mention, one of the things, the City of Columbus has taken more focus with Mayor Ginther there um, on combating this internally as well. We're still working with the ECTF, but we're also dedicating more Columbus Police resources, Division of Refuse resources to these smaller uh, crimes as well. But what we also want to be aware of, and that's why we continue to work very close with Swaco and, and Heather on this, is we don't want to push a problem just outside the city limits because there's townships that surround us or there's little areas of townships that are unincorporated within the Columbus area. So I don't want to do enforcement right here and just push the problem one block out of the city of Columbus. We want to make sure we take care of the problem and get rid of it. And that's why it's critical that we continue to work together because we only have from the Division of Refuse standpoint, we only control what's in the city of Columbus, but we don't want to just push this area. It's a regional issue that we're trying to solve. It's not just in the city of Columbus. 
Thank you. And, and last question for everyone. This is for all of you. Um, are there any thoughts or resources that we may not have touched on uh, this evening that you'd like to share? Desmond? No, sir. Not really. I can't think of any right now. Um, it would be helpful for, for me to have more um, documentation of all of this to be able to possibly attach to our monthly newsletter and be able to um, talk to our residents about. Because um, we've been really, since I've been on the board, I've just been kind of going around and trying to find what I can and condensing and being able to educate that way. But if you guys have um, brochures, information that could help us in the community, we'd be happy to distribute. Because I think the education is going to be the first step really with us. and. Um, you know, making people aware of all, how it affects, you know, the neighborhood, the consequences, and all that sort of thing. Um, I'll just repeat that I did bring brochures and, and cards over there for folks that are interested in the Environmental Crimes Task Force. Um, there are some other resources. I'm actually going to hand it over to Heather to talk about um, through the Environmental Court that, that may be interesting to people, too. That's a great point. We do have kind of a secret weapon here in Franklin County. It is the environmental court, and Judge Dan Hawkins has been our envir judge, environmental judge for, oh goodness, quite a few years now, six, eight years. But um, when an environmental crime is filed in Franklin County, it's routed to the environmental court. And we have a judge who already understands all of the issues we've been talking about tonight and the importance of the littering and open dumping issue in the communities. I, I, he's very well aware of it. So he works with us on these creative sentencings. And the Environmental Crimes Court, the Environmental Court, has a cleanup program run by the court. So when we convict people of polluting, those defendants go on to a cleanup crew run by the court, and it's sent out into neighborhoods that have been the victims of dumping. So we will have defendants cleaning up parks, clean, walking along the roadsides and cleaning up the roadsides. Uh, on one memorable occasion, I had some defendants basically scaling down into a ravine to remove some trash they dumped into a creek. So the environmental courtroom, uh, Judge Hawkins, is definitely a resource that we should be talking about. Certainly, and, and to let to piggyback onto that, we, we work closely with that group to focus them on, uh, typically in the city of Columbus, we work in the alleys. Uh, our in littering plan that uh, Sherry spoke about, what we really want to do is we want the residents to take ownership of the front of the houses. We want the businesses to take ownership of the commercial corridors, and the city is going to come in and take care of those alleys through the, with the help of the ECTF, the, uh, the community uh, work hours that they have to do, our illegal dumping initiative that uh, Mayor Ginther's put in place. We're going to work on cleaning those alleys up, but it's going to be a, where the residents, you have to take ownership of your neighborhoods to solve this problem. We're asking you to do that in the front of the houses. We're going to look at the alleys and what we can do, but we're not going to be able to do all of this by ourselves. Uh, we have some resources out there that we can help, but we're not going to be able to solve it by ourselves. Thank you very much to all of you, and uh, we appreciate uh, your time this evening. We'll now move into the public comment or public speaking section. We have a few speakers here this evening, and so I'd ask that you come up to the mic, state your name and your, your address, and remind you that you have three minutes to speak. Our first speaker this evening is Beth Kluklowski. Welcome, Beth. We appreciate you coming in. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm Beth Klukowski. I'm a 41-year resident of North Linden, and I have seen a lot of renters move into the neighborhood in the past 41 years, and a lot of homeowners um, move out or pass on. I have seen the neighborhood turn into, um, unfortunately, into a transient kind of community where it seems like a lot of people move in with the intent of being where they are until they are evicted. So there isn't much ownership, there isn't much pride, there isn't much hope, and there's a whole lot of poverty. 
um, and there's a whole lot of trash. It's like call 311 before you put your stuff out. Well, people don't no, they, they don't call 311 and get a date to put their things out. They put stuff out and they never call 311 to request a bulk pickup. So back in the summer, North Linden and South Linden was greatly blessed with Safe Streets program with the Columbus Division of Police. And one of the things that Sergeant Dana Hess mentioned at a block watch meeting was that the Safe Streets officers wanted to help with some community cleanup and we should let them know if there were problems in the area. I'm not doing this right. That's, no, it's okay. I'm just going to do it for you. Okay. Thank you, darling. <laughs> so I sent a letter a little short email to Sergeant Hess about a week after they had told us that at our block watch meeting. And I said, just in case y'all want to perform some magic, I just did a little informal survey in the alley south of Aberdeen from where it starts just east of McGuffey to where it ends just west of Cleveland Avenue because it doesn't quite go all the way to McGuffey. It doesn't quite go all the way to Cleveland, but it almost. I counted 54 occurrences of bulk pickup, yard waste, brush and branches, and scattered trash. I didn't even try to count the places with tall weeds abandoned vehicles, and I didn't have that in the note, I added that sitting here thinking tonight, the abandoned vehicles or the tire dumps. Can y'all really gather the forces to resolve these messes, or should I start connecting each problem with the street address so I can make those 54 311 calls? If you all can really gather the forces, I counted 44 occurrences in the alley south of Minnesota and about 35 in the alley north of Aberdeen. If you do some real quick math, that's 133 occurrences in just three alleys in this neighborhood where someone would say to me, and I'd say, you know, there's bulk pickup, there's trash, there's things that need to be taken care of, and they say to me, did you call 311? And that's a horrible, huge load to put on someone to expect them to make 133 311 reports to get this bulk stuff cleaned up out of our neighborhood. So it's like you guys are concerned about stopping the dumping. I'm really concerned about getting that stuff out of here so we aren't living in the middle of this mess. It looks like people who live here don't care. And there are a lot of people who live here who care a whole lot. Ski, I appreciate your time this evening and we appreciate it. Our next speaker is Laura Fay. Laura, if you, Ms. Fay, if you could come up and state your name and your address and remind you that you're limited to three minutes. My name is Laura Fay, and I represent the Friends of the Lower Olentangy Watershed. Our address is 3528 North High Street, Suite F, 43214. And uh, we totally acknowledge all the um, human issues associated with litter, but I'm here to represent tonight the watersheds of, of Columbus and the ecological issues of all the plastic bags, the cigarette butts, um, styrofoam is really bad. It just keeps getting smaller, but it's there. So um, we wanted to talk, um, and w we love you all. Uh, we're all part of the same team, so don't take this bad. But um, we would like to put ourselves out of the litter cleanup business, um, I, especially before I retire. So um, first thing is we have a tree nursery in Wineland Park. It's right near an alley. It's got one of those 300 gallon dumpsters. And uh, I was shocked to hear one of our workers say that when the truck came around to pick it up, the uh, 
truck dumped half of the waste on the ground. So um, if the issue is that the, it's loose and, and the truck picker-uppers think it should be in a bag, maybe we could give people uh, plastic bags so that things aren't falling out. Um, we're, we're continually picking up trash there. So not sure what can be done, but it's apartment. So I heard you mention homes, so just an idea. Another thing is we see a lot of trash on State Route 315. And someone told me the plastic bags blow out of the trash trucks as they're headed down to Swaco. So um, I, I don't know what we could do about that. Tighter covers on the top, teaching people that they need to recycle plastic bags at grocery stores and not in their trash. But we'd like that addressed as well. Uh, one issue that we see a lot, and this is sad, is homeless camps in floodplains. So, they have sleeping bags, carpets, you name it. And then when the water comes up and they get wet, they just abandon everything. And um, so one issue maybe is we have too much invasive species there. So Columbus has their ecological restoration program that removes that honeysuckle. So the homeless people would not like that because it gives them good cover. So maybe in our flood prone areas, if we could get out that invasive species, then homeless people could find someplace high and dry to call home. Um, another thing uh, is the lack of trash cans, especially on our main streets like High Street. OSU got rid of their trash cans because they think everyone will carry out their trash with them. I don't think that's true. So. I'm proposing that we put more trash cans in and give people jobs. People in this town need jobs. So um, just, and that would be our hope. Um, one more thing is concrete washout. We have some ecological areas where people dump and we don't see them to complain, but um, not sure what can be done there. Cigarette butts, lots of education on cigarette butts. Car manufacturers aren't putting ashtrays anymore. so. Maybe Keep Columbus Beautiful could give out those uh, cigarette butt um, cups. There's some over on the table. There, there's bigger ones too, but um, just the education. They're not cotton fibers, they're plastic, and they end up in our rivers and our oceans and our fish. And the last thing is storm sewer education. A lot of people don't understand that the pop bottle or the water bottle they throw out and goes into a storm sewer, they think that's going down to the sewer, sewer. And instead it ends up in a river. And so um, some great art projects like the city of Dayton, maybe Columbus could consider to get people's mind focused. Sorry, I did go over. Thank you so much, Ms. Faye. We appreciate your time this evening. Our next speaker is Pam Unger. Pam, if you, Ms. Unger, if you could uh, state your name and your address. And I don't see a clock here. Wave at me. <laughs> um, my name is Pam Unger. I am your neighbor in Salem Village, a little north of here. But I spent um, about 35 years in Old Town East, the area now known as Old Town East on the Near East Side. And I was thinking as I sat here, we must have been really cutting edge because I remember organizing the first alley cleanup in the mid 70s. And the problem we encountered then has not changed. And that is that most of the people that we encountered um, who saw us doing the cleanup work assumed that we were either city inspectors and so they were a little hostile or that we were uh, parolees or prisoners or otherwise um, being ordered to do the cleanup. And of course, I participated fairly recently in a couple of kick butt Columbus campaigns where we tried to clean the uh, on ramps near my community. And again, we're met with so much disrespect and hostility because, again, it was assumed that we weren't doing this from any kind of civic pride, that we were doing it because it was court ordered. And so when I had to put down a topic that I wanted to address, there are so many um, around this issue that I feel strongly about. But what I said was, 
we need to figure out a way to make litter sexy. Think about this. It has to come from our kids and young people. And what do they associate litter with? Their mom or maybe their dad telling them, get this junk cleaned up. So there's already a kind of built in, you can't make me about it. Or again, they consider it something that people wearing orange jumpsuits do, not something that they're responsible for. And I think the way that we talk about litter can trivialize it. It's not just a mess. It's not just an unsightly aesthetic problem. It's hurting our community. It's hurting our planet. And if we raise youngsters to, I don't know, start protectors of the earth leagues or, or something in the school that make it not just checking off a box on a service project, but genuinely beginning to connect with what happens to our neighborhood, what happens to our earth if we throw out our plastic, if we throw out our cigarette butts. Surely I have talked at least three minutes now, but I could go on and on. Thank you. So much, Ms. Sunger, we appreciate it. Our next speaker this evening is Mr. Minister Kujenga Ashe. If you could, uh, Minister Ashe, if you could state your name and your address, we appreciate that. Honor to the Almighty, Creator, by whatever name you call him, to Councilman Remy, all of you on the uh, panel there today. Glad to see you. I'm very humbled to be here today. Uh, I am Minister Kujenga Elia Ashe. I live at 1119 East 16th Avenue, Columbus 43211 in South Linden. And I am a member of the Baptist Ministerial Alliance of Columbus, Ohio, and vicinity. Um, president Laws, Tyrone Laws is the president, member of the Interdenominational Ministerial Alliance of Columbus, Ohio, and President Dr. John Costa II. And I am a, I'm here representing today the concerned Linden clergy. And our chairman is Pastor Charles Tatum of Good Shepherd on the corner of Hudson and Cleveland. And our co-chair is Bishop Les Sims of Living Waters Apostolic Church on Cleveland and 21st. I'm representing the Concerned Lending Clergy. Uh, I do a lot of things. I go to the United Nations in New York City and do a lot of other things. My concern, um, I'm, excuse me for being late because I was at the school board meeting. They're trying to take the lending kids to East and, and all of that stuff. And that's, that's going to create a big problem. My concern is that the, what we haven't really talked about, the litter really is a health problem. It creates a health problem. And uh, we haven't really talked about that. Uh, most of the people in Linden at this point in time, I, I organized the first North and South Linden Commission meetings as a unity meeting in, uh, a couple months ago. It's the first time they met as North and South Linden Commissions in 47 years since we had the riots of Linda McKinley in 1971. So we're trying to pull together. And we have about 200,000 votes. And we'd like to give those to, to folks that are on council and we'd like to continue and all that good stuff. But we're, have, we're gonna have a hard time because there's some things that are happening that are not good for us. Uh, blueprint, number one, uh, is got a great idea with the water and, and making, to keep the water from running downtown, all that good stuff but it's gonna create more mosquitoes in the neighborhood. And we're already spraying for the Nile virus and all that kind of stuff. So you need to make sure that you spend a little more money when you have Blueprint, all the houses are tearing down now in the city that you take and put some more money in spraying for those mosquitoes because that's gonna be a problem. We've got mice, possums, groundhogs, we've got uh, geese. And when you make those big water tables, they're gonna come like the geese out here out front when you drove up here. When you make those water tables all over the Linden area, you're going to have more animals coming and drinking that water. And that's going to be a problem. You need to get some traps to trap these possums and groundhogs. We don't have too many rats. We got a lot of mice. We got a lot of mice. We got a lot of groundhogs. We got a lot of possums and raccoons. And the city needs to understand that they need to put some money in the budget to trap these animals and dispose of them because the homeowners can't do that. I own my home in South Linden. I'm a, I'm a stakeholder and my family's lived in the house for 50 years. So that is a health problem because with the geese and all the droppings and all that stuff, that creates uh, 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 disease and filth. 
And then with the trash, the corner stores need to be fined and taxed because if people go to the corner stores, they take the trash and just throw it everywhere after they come out of the corner stores. Well, the corner stores either need to pick that trash up or they need to be fined for not picking it up or have somebody pick it up that can. Finally, I submitted a program in closing, the Job and Safety Program, which you should have a copy of. All City Council has a copy of it. Uh, Pastor uh, Turner and I put that together. He's deceased now. The Job and Safety Program would hire Linden residents to actually pick up a lot of this trash. The alleys look terrible. There's trash everywhere. It blows everywhere. People are not home until Mr. Shuni and the Department of Development can get together and make people more homeowners, like my sister, my sister said over here. We're going to have more problems because we have a transient community. So that's a part of the problem. So I'm just saying spend a little more money on us and look at some of these issues. I'm willing to work with any of you. Concerned Linden Clergy meets once a month at Good Shepherd on Hudson Cleveland on Thursdays at 6.30, the last Thursday in the month. We invite you to come. Thank you, Mr. Remy. Thank you for your time, people. Thank you, Minister Shea. Appreciate your time this evening. Our final speaker this evening is Chris Sewell. Chris, uh, Mr. Sewell, if you come forward, state your name and your address and any uh, organization you may represent. Uh, Chris Sewell, City of Columbus, Department of Neighborhoods. Uh, I just really have three quick statements about um, the littering community. In my short time working for the city, um, I realized that it was three things um, that happens mainly when dealing with uh, littering trash. One is home ownership, two is accountability, uh, and three is education. When you look at Linden as a whole, we have a 60 to 40 percent ratio of rent or home ownership. Typically, if you live in a community, you own a home, you own property, you're invested in that community. Uh, I know the city has put, put huge emphasis on trying to make uh, neighborhoods more home owned because typically I live there, I have invested there, so I'm going to care more about my community, my surroundings. Uh, kind of similar to what uh, Ms. Tompkins said about neighbors holding other neighbors accountable, saying, hey, no, you're not going to dump that, we're going to report that, um, and use the trash cans, pick up the trash, walk the streets, talk to your neighbors, uh, and kind of figure out what it is that we can do collectively to kind of fix the trash issue uh, in our neighborhoods. And three, uh, education. Not a lot of people understand what bulk pickup is. Um, they say, I'm throwing something on the curb, I'll leave it there. And as a neighbor, I may get tired of seeing that, that bulk pickup, and what do I do? I call. And so naturally, as the person that put the bulk out there, they think, oh, if I put it out there, it just is going to get picked up. And so we have a continuous cycle of people just throwing trash out, throwing bulk pickup out there, and having the neighbor call because, hey, I'm tired of looking at that trash. And so there may be a lack of education, but I know from being a liaison for the Department of Neighborhoods, I've had um, – Keep Columbus Beautiful, come out and talk to neighbors. I've taken brochures and pamphlets um, to these communities. And so it's not that the resources are not available, it's that the community has to buy in about where they live at and what they can do to kind of keep our, our, our neighborhoods better uh, and safer. I know as a part of our, our initiative for our department of neighborhoods, cleaning up alleys is a part of the safe strategy because we know that if our, if our alleys are clean, it prevents crime, prevents sex trafficking, uh, prevents these killings and overdoses because, hey, there's nowhere to hide in these alleyways. So um, as a community resident and a, and a leader in my community, uh, it falls on us as a community whole um, and take an initiative of, of taking more responsibility of caring about our, our neighborhoods in the inner city and, and doesn't have to rely on government to, to come and figure, fix the problem. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sewell. We appreciate your time. We do have one final speaker, um, Alyssa Yoder Mann. Um, if uh, Ms. Mann, if you could come forward and state your name and any organization you represent in your address, you have three minutes. Thank you. Yeah, I'm Elissa Yoderman. I represent the Ohio chapter Sierra Club. Um, so we have collaborated a lot with Keep Columbus Beautiful and we do a lot of cleanups. Um, but I just wanted to piggyback off of what Tim said, of really expanding that this is not just a Columbus problem. So I don't know if you guys noticed in the news yesterday, Cuyahoga County is concerned um, because now China won't take their waste. Uh, Ohio EPA solid waste management came out and said that the state of Ohio has a 40 year waste capacity in our state. So what is that going to mean once China stops taking our recycling and now China is eyeing a plan that by 2020 they're going to ban the import of waste. So how is that number that 40 years which isn't that long going to change once the place that we were sending our waste you know, isn't going to take it anymore. And so what we have seen successful in other municipalities is when we put fees on items such as single use items and create a negative consequence, you know, a fee if you want to choose that plastic bag. So in 2016, the International 
Um, cleanup is uh, funded by Surfrider Foundation identified that the top seven items out of the, the top out of the top 10, seven items were identified as auxiliary containers. So auxiliary containers are pop bottles, uh, plastic bags, straws, um, takeout, takeout containers, foam, all those kind of things. So uh, to tie our hands even, so we know that these single use items are a huge problem. Seven out of the top 10 things that were found in this international cleanup are auxiliary containers. We currently have a Senate Bill 210 in place that wants to take away your rights as a municipality to curb, uh, to take away the home rule and not allow cities to make decisions on how to best address waste. They want to have a statewide, um, statewide, um, plan on how to address waste. The Ohio EPA came out and said in their report of this 40-year waste that they want, they see a successful plan is on the, group, on the ground, run by municipalities, run by businesses, run by communities, run by local stakeholders. It's not by the state. And so taking a step back and really this larger issue, you know, what's going to happen if Senate Bill 210 does pass? And, you know, this conversation you know, you guys are only limited if, if, this, if this passes. Um, so it is really, really concerning that we don't see more of our local leaders standing up for their local rights and ensuring that home rule uh, maintains our local decisions on how to address um, waste. I do think that there is a little bit of a flip, like there is a lot of uh, pushing it back on the community, like um, holding holding cleanups primarily in right of way areas. I mean, I hold cleanups with little kids. Like, I'm not going to put them in in harm's way. You know, the places that 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 my members enjoy. We have 2,500 members here in Columbus, are not in right of way areas. They're in greenway areas. So I th I think that there is a little bit of disconnect between your focus is kind of on the business aspect and the appearance of the city, but it's not actually solving the root problem. Thank you so much. We appreciate your time this evening. Thank you to everybody. Um, this is just the beginning of many discussions. I mean, we've, you know, littering is not a new problem, obviously, but we're certainly uh, wanting this to be a robust discussion that's ongoing, um, a reminder that we're having a, the second public hearing on Thursday evening, uh, d discovering a litter-free Columbus Part Two, uh, on October 4th at the Dodge Recreation Center, which is located at 667 Sullivan Avenue, from 6 to 7:30. Following these hearings, the city uh, will compile thoughts, ideas, and suggestions shared tonight to create a more comprehensive plan to address litter in the city of Columbus. In the meantime, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, or would like to share your ideas, feel free to email me at evremy, E-V-R-E-M-Y, at columbus.gov, or call 614-645-3559. Thank you to Sherry Palmer, our panelists Desmond Chapman, Melissa Tompkins, Andrew Booker, Heather Robinson, and Tim Swagger. I'd like to thank CTV for being here this evening, our Rex and Park staff, Officer Banks, uh, I see standing in the back, uh, our Green Spot um, being here this evening, Project Blueprint, and of course, Keep Columbus Beautiful. Please feel free to stop by on your way out and collect any of the uh, information that uh, they might have brought this evening. And I'd be remiss if I didn't thank my staff, um, again, Jeff Carter and Lucy Frank for putting this all together. And all of it, everybody from our uh, Columbus City Council team, uh, Matt Erickson, and most importantly, thank you to the community for your comments and, and feedback this evening. It, it is truly um, uh, appreciated. That concludes this public hearing, and we look forward to our next discussion on Thursday evening. Thank you. Thank you.